This is the second part of our episode on 10 surprising similarities between Islam and Judaism. Just like part one, you're going to see some Jewish and Muslim similarities that are literally identical. So what's going on guys? This is Leroy Kenton coming back with another video. And by the way, if you haven't seen part one, I have a link to it below in the video description section. Yeah, you got to see part one. It started a really awesome conversation in the comment section. Okay, so let's jump into this episode though. Starting at number 10, we have the calendar. One of the most interesting similarities between Judaism and Islam is the calendar calendar. In both Islam and Judaism, the calendar is based on the cycles of the moon. The month begins by the sighting of the moon or calculating when the new moon will be in the sky. The start of the year is called Rosh Hashanah in Judaism, which in Arabic is called Ras Asana. Then there's Yom Kippur, which corresponds to Ashura in Islam. Following that, there's a famous Jewish holiday, Passover, which corresponds to the Muslim Laylat al-Barat in the month of Shabbat. Serifat Ha Omar in Judaism corresponds to Ramadan in Islam, and Shavuot lines up with Eid al Fatir, and the 9th of Av happens during the time of the Muslim Hajj. So it's pretty surprising that practically all the major holidays and events in Judaism and Islam correspond. Next up is circumcision. Now, this was one I was gonna put into part one, but I didn't know if YouTube was gonna flag my video. Like, literally, I've been flagged for saying the word God, which is crazy, but this time around, I'm I'm like, you know, I can't really hold back on the facts. So here it is, right? So both Islam and Judaism, they practice male circumcision. In the Bible, Abraham was commanded to be circumcised, and this would become a symbol of the promise that God made to Abraham as well as his offspring. What we promote in Islam is male circumcision because this is uh, regarded not only as the sunnah or practice of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but a practice that goes back all the way to the Prophet Abraham and has been practiced by many prophets since. So of course, the practice continued with Abraham. Abraham's children. The Torah lays out the instructions that says that newborns should be circumcised on the eighth day after birth. Now, science has shown that the eighth day is very important. Why? Because the levels of vitamin K are the highest on that day, and vitamin K plays an important role in stopping bleeding. The command for circumcision isn't in the Quran, however, but the Prophet Muhammad required it for his male followers, which makes sense because Jews and Muslims have pretty much the same history. We should avoid uh, female circumcision altogether, but male circumcision, this is not known to be harmful. I, I'm not aware of any study which shows that this is harmful. Jesus himself is said to have been circumcised. At number eight, we have female head covering. Both Islam and Judaism encourage modesty in your parents and also promote that women Women should cover their hair. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole ins and outs of why women's heads have to be covered, but I just want to point out that the similarity exists. The general belief of when and why women should cover their hair does have some differences, though, in both the religions. Many married Jewish women wear a headscarf to cover their hair. Islam instructs that women wear a headscarf or hijab after puberty. Along with the head covering, though, both religions encourage women to dress modestly in general. This includes wearing long and loose fitting clothing, you know? Don't want to be showing all your female body parts imprinted out. There is no source that states directly, in black and white, that a married woman must cover her head. We see it indirectly in the scriptures. Let's move on. We have the Hadith and the Talmud up next at number seven. The Islamic Hadith and the Jewish Talmud have also been compared because they are both authoritative texts that are outside of the actual scriptures. The Hadith and the Talmud texts were originally passed down through oral tradition for generations before being put in writing. We're taking a look at religious law at number six. Judaism and Islam are unique in having their own systems of religious law, which is also based on oral tradition. Oftentimes, these laws can override the written laws, and also, there's no real distinction of them being religious laws only. These laws are often seen as laws period, not bound by religious affiliation. In Islam, the laws are called Sharia, and in Judaism, they're known as Halakha. Both Judaism and Islam consider learning and studying religious law to be a form of worship, 
to God. Now in at number five, the halfway spot, we have the similarities in the belief in the tailbone. Yeah, I know, right? Like, what am I talking about anyway? So let me get into that. So there's this small bone in the body at the base of the spinal column called the Luz bone, known to some as the coccyx or the cervical vertebra. It's believed that from this bone, the body will be rebuilt at the time of resurrection. Muslims and Jews share the belief that this bone does not decay. Muslims refer to this bone as Abju al Thanab. Jews believe that people will be resurrected from what they called Luz in the backbone. Yeah, no, pretty interesting similarity. And number four, we have homosexuality. So this is another touchy topic that people get super worked up about, so I'll do my best to be as sensitive as possible to people of all beliefs. The sacred texts of both Islam and Judaism ban homosexuality and label it as a sin. Now, this has been a much debated point, especially over the past century. Um, the most liberal orthodox positions on this are that gay sex is itself a sin, but, the, but we're all sinners, and so a person who engages in that is still a Jew and still is welcome within the community. Depending on who you speak to, homosexuality is viewed as morally wrong or it's viewed simply as being not as beneficial to humanity as heterosexual relationships which allow for procreation. Not only that, any form of sexual relations outside of marriage is also forbidden in Judaism and Islam. What is forbidden in our religion is the action of intimacy outside of marriage. What is not forbidden, the Sharia does not forbid feelings of the heart. Number three brings us the universal religion. So the next similarity for the most part is going to be quoted because I think it's said pretty well anyways. So the Jewish rabbi Ben Abrahamson, he says, Judaism believes that there is a basic religion which the whole world must follow. In the Quran, it says there is only one religion which is acceptable before Allah, which is Islam. We believe that there is one faith that's required by all mankind and we call it the faith of Noah. This is similar to what is written in the Surah Ashura, and it says that he has laid down the same religion for you as he enjoined on Noah, that which we have revealed to you and which we enjoined to Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. Establish a religion and do not make divisions in it. You can also find a similar idea in Judaism that there is one religion that was given to Adam. It involved monotheism and it involves basically seven of the Ten Commandments. They had to believe in reward and punishment. You had to also believe in the last day. You had to believe in the prophets of God. And this is a religion that is required of all mankind. It's required of Jews and non-Jews. Now the second last similarity is the sects and branches. Although they both call for one religion, various sects and branches exist inside of Judaism and Islam. The most popular division in Islam are Sunni, then there's Shia Muslims, and then there's the Karajites. There are also three traditional types of schools in Islam. There's the schools of jurisprudence, the Sufi orders, and the schools of theology. In Judaism, denominations or branches include different groups which have developed among the Jews from ancient times. The main branches today are Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, and Reconstructionist. Of course, several other smaller branches exist as well. And the final similarity I got to share in this episode is is Muslims are mentioned in the Old Testament. So this final similarity is also derived from studies of Rabbi Ben Abrahamson. And when asked if Islam was mentioned in the Old Testament of the Bible, he said yes. In Exodus, when Jethro, aka Shoeb, the father-in-law of Moses, went and made an offering, the offering that he had made was called Shlamim. In other words, a perfect or complete offering. And all the followers of Shoeb or Jethro were called Kenites in the Torah, but in the translation of the Torah in Aramaic, they were also called Salamai Muslamim. So we have the word Muslamim there, meaning the children of Jethro, and it meant much more than that because it actually meant that these were God fearers, meaning people who had great reverence for God. And these were people who were not part of the children of Israel, but believed in one God and followed the commandments of God. And that's what a Muslim is, one who submits to following God. Period. 
All right guys, so I covered a lot in this episode and let me know down below in the comment section what other similarities do you know about and feel free to just comment on anything else that I shared in this episode. And I look forward to reading your comments and responding to them. Okay guys, so if you enjoyed this episode, then you gotta tap this one that you see on your screen right here. I'll also have a link to it down below in the video description section. And while you're at that, hit that subscribe button and ring that bell so you can be notified of future episodes here on FTD Facts. Okay guys, you have been awesome and I can't wait to see you tomorrow in another episode.